everybody. Welcome to the Hallmarkies podcast. We are really excited today to bring you a very special interview. Uh, I'm film critic Rachel Wagner, and today we are talking to the showrunner for both When Calls the Heart and uh, When Hope Calls, uh, Alfonso Moreno. And thank you so much, Alfonso, for coming on the podcast. Oh, believe me, I'm happy to be here. Thank yes. you. Yes. So what we like to do uh, on our podcast is we like to give our guests a chance to introduce themselves and to tell us what inspired you to, in your case, pursue a career in, in television. I'm uh, one of these people who can, you know, literally from the time I can remember, as long as I remember, I was like five years old and people would ask me what I wanted to be and I'd say a writer. And I'm not exactly sure why I identified that, but I just always knew I wanted, that's what I wanted to be. So I, you know, I ended up going to um, film school as an undergrad and, but as an, you know, my path to a writer was a little bit longer in that when I finished uh, going to film school at UCLA, I didn't see a real path to becoming a writer. I couldn't see how, like the next step is you go to school and you're an engineer, you people, you know, literally hire you to do that, but that's not the way it is in, in this industry. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, rather than waiting by, uh, by, the, by the phone, hoping someone would call, I would um, become a lawyer and then I could sort of produce my own work. So I ended up going to law school and uh, I practiced for a few years and I went back to, and then after that, I went back to film school and got a uh, master's in, in screenwriting. But it, it turned out that becoming a lawyer helped me in, in a way I had not anticipated in becoming a writer. There are a lot of legal shows and uh, these legal shows often want uh, writers who are lawyers because mm -hmm. you can write legal shows very sort of more realistically. So that was ultimately my, my path in is right, literally soon after I finished uh, the, my master's program at UCLA, I, I got within like six weeks, I got my first job writing uh, on a new series uh, and it was a police show but it was a police officer's first experience in a courtroom so they hired me because of my legal experience to sort of make that sort of, uh, a realistic sort of uh, yeah. story and then from then on I just sort of continued on as a writer and and, uh, and then a writer producer that's so cool yeah so you started it was the guardian was your first? Well, no, I go way back. It's, oh, go it's way back. Farther back than that. Yeah, um, I used to uh, write for a show called uh, uh, Murder One, which is a legal show. Oh. And, um, the Practice, which is also a legal show. Oh, yeah. So those are my, uh, those are the first yeah. shows I uh, w uh, was working yeah. on. Then I went to work uh, for NCIS and The Guardian, mm -hmm. Dr. Diva. So, yeah. you know, a, a long sort of a longest career, which is always yeah. a great thing to have in this industry. That's great. Did you grow up in the States or were you in? Uh, I grew up in Northern or... California. Oh, Northern California. Near San Francisco. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, my grandparents, uh, they lived in um, in Walnut Creek. And, ah, yeah. Oh, I'm really familiar with that, that yeah, kind very, of area. Very warm there. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> really nice. Well, the warmer parts of the area, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's cool. And uh, so, yeah, was it, was it really, did you have like a freak out moment when you had your first script that you'd ever done? Was that just a, a do you remember that? I do remember that. And it, it, what, what was odd about it is that when you were in, then at least when I was in film school, to get you know, a master's in film, you ended up writing, you had to write, among other, the writing you did was uh, feature films. So I wrote, you know, in order, you have to take a lot of other just basic courses in production and direction. But the writing is all feature. So my first job was to write a television script, and which mm -hmm. I had never done before, right? Because they didn't at the time ever teach television writing. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, it's much of the same sort of basics, but it's just a different, you know, a slightly different animal. Sure. So that was sort of my first experience. And then since then, I've just been in television this whole career but uh so it wasn't a, a, so much as a, a freak out moment but it was a quick learning uh how to do something a little differently than i had been uh, yeah. taught in school at least yeah so you didn't have to do like the whole spec script kind of game or 
that kind of thing? No, I was fortunate because uh, in, when I was in film school, uh, the, you know, the, there was a much, many of the professors were like, you know, had been not in the industry for a long time and they had, uh, and they were tenured, but uh, my last, my thesis script was with a visiting professor who was a working writer by the name of Dan Pine. And he had done a lot of feature films like Doc Hollywood and, um, and uh, another one was called Pacific Heights. Mm-hmm. So he, he had, was really connected in, in, in the industry. So, and when I finished my last script there, he recommended me to a friend of his who was just getting a series off the ground. So it was just a, a, a really fortunate sort of path in. So th- I was hired on for that, his friend series. And then this Dan Pine got his own series and he hired me for that. And then he recommended me to someone else. So, so for the first three or four years of my career was all because of this one professor who just was well connected. So I was very That's, fortunate just to yeah. sort of go right into it. That's great. That's really cool. Uh, so I'm, I'm really curious about the whole behind the scenes of a show. So you have the showrunner, then you have the writers, you have the producers, you have the director of an episode, you have all these people involved. So when you, uh, I'm just curious about the decision-making process and, and how that all works. So do, do you, t- as a, as a showrunner, do you come up with the whole concept for the whole season and then you say to the writer here's what you want to write about or do you, did the writers come to you and say here's what i want to write about here's my script and then you work it into the arc of the whole season what happens is that um you know the writer's room is in uh in los angeles and i'm as the showrunner i'm, I'm the head writer so mm-hmm. I have my writers, we all sort of are in the same room and we uh, sort of just talk things through in the room. And I, I, I end up giving the, the, the network and uh, Brad Corvoy, the, uh, the head of the MPCA, who's the, sort of the studio in this, in this instance, the w- on, sort of a document that says this is basically what I want to do during the course of the year without a lot of some specifics, but some generalities. And then, you know, they, you know, they review it, give me their thoughts, give me their notes on that. And then for each, for each episode, I, I send uh, the the storylines to Hallmark and to Brad Cravoy and, and get their notes on, on it so that script after they I get their notes on my proposed stories and the writers are all in the writer's room with me so I'll you know I'll sign them uh scripts and we'll work out this the story beats uh uh in the room so that when the script comes in you know it's it's already there are not a lot of surprises because we've worked out every what the beats will be yeah and are you thinking more than even just more than the season or do you usually just kind of stay with that season arc? Generally, I stay uh, on just that season arc. Uh, Sometimes I'm thinking a little bit ahead, but uh, there's so much that can change within a season that if I were to go beyond that, it would like, I could be, I've gone really way off course. So I have to sort of see how how one season ends uh, and then versus how the, you know, then I can know where I can start from. At the uh, beginning of season six of When Calls the Heart, I knew I wanted to end the season with that dance. Oh, and really? Elizabeth, uh, you know, choosing Lucas and, and Nathan, uh, you know, seeing that and, and walking out and, and seeing the look between them. That, that's sort of the, I had identified that moment just so I, because I wanted that to, you know, I'd wanted, had, I'd hoped to develop a, a team Lucas and a team Nathan sort of approach to the se- season. And I knew that if I ended it that way, that the, that the social media uh, would sort of uh, run with that. Yeah. And it, and it, and they did. <laughs> well, I definitely want to ask you more about that, but I have to ask you, so you were, were you a showrunner or just a writer for Adopted Diva? 
I was a, a on my my first show running job was with uh, one call one calls the heart. Prior okay. to that, I'd been a co executive producer and oh, okay. uh, supervising producers on on different shows. On on Drop Dead Diva, I believe I was a co a co executive okay. producer. I, I love that. Show. Sometimes you're yeah, that was fun. Yeah. And that was another show that had you know that that was a show they wanted me to come in because I was a, a lawyer and it had yeah. and, you know the it had a lot of humor. But it, you yeah. know, dealt with this one character who, um, you know, her her job was to be a lawyer. Well, three of the characters. Yeah. Lawyers. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. loved that show. I thought it was so funny. And I love Brooke so much. It's kind of my dream to, that she'll be in a Hallmark movie someday. Because I just think yeah, she she'd was, be great. Yeah, she would she's be so good in something. Yeah. And something yeah. a little different. You know, we haven't had anybody quite like her, I feel like. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think she'd and, be fantastic. I think that's and, an excellent idea. Yeah. And I just, I love her energy and how positive she was because I don't know, like a lot of, uh, a lot of people uh, are a lot of times they try to do like the empowered plus size woman. Um, but then it ends up just being a bunch of like fat jokes. And so it's, it's kind of like self-defeating. And like, I felt that way with the pitch perfect series that, that fat Amy started as this really awesome character that I loved. And by the end, she just was a total joke. And it was very frustrating to me, but I felt like in drop dead diva, she was such, because she wasn't inside. That's not who she was. Right. And so yeah. she was such a unique, like empowering, funny, confident character. And uh, I just, I loved it. I, I thought it was so good. Yeah. And you know, it, it that was a, a lifetime show, but it had elements of Hallmark and then yeah. it had, a lot of uh it had humor but it had just uh a good emotion we like you know like emotion where you you tear up and but not in a sad way right yeah. that's uh so i i really think that was yeah. along the lines of the, sh the show it did i mean great it, actress. was it funny for you as a as a as somebody who'd been to law school as an attorney um just some of those cases were so silly <laughs> yeah that yeah and that's and, you know, you try to do that kind of, you know, it's when I was on the practice on the same lot was uh, Allie McBeal, which is the yeah. same sort of thing. The practice dealt with these really serious cases and then Allie McBeal was sort of the odd sort of, uh, you know, yeah, straining uh, credulity sort of case. But, you right. know, they're fun. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, I could definitely see that comparison uh, for sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but, you know, there was Team Grayson, and Team Owen, and Drop the Diva. Yeah. And I was wondering yeah. if that was kind of inspirational a little bit for kind of going that route. You know, I didn't even think about that when I was doing it. I was, you know, I was more thinking in terms of, uh, you know, like I know that Twilight had that too, you know, the team, yeah. uh, the two teams. And, uh, and I wanted... I wanted to do something, you know, coming out of Jack's uh, death, I wanted to do something that was just different, that, yeah. you know, that just to take it out of its, what had been done before. And I, and I really, yeah. um, that, that really worked. And then I felt that we got some uh, really strong actors to come in and really, really and, and I know that, you know, the feedback I, I got from the actors on set, they, they really appreciated sort of, you know, the direction that we went. So that was, yeah. that was gratifying. So how did you become involved with When Calls the Heart? How did you uh, start, uh, uh, you know, working with them, writing with them? and, and uh, they, they contacted me, you know, in the, uh -huh. in, the, in the process in this industry is that, you know, they, they contact your agent or your manager and they, you know, just, you know, talk to you and, and you come in and you, um, you know, you, uh, this meet with I met with uh, the Brad Cravoy and then I met with uh, Hallmark and then we just you know went from there mm -hmm. so did so you knew obviously that Daniel wanted to exit the show and so what was yeah. that like kind of planning the season and trying to make it work when you know it was obviously going to be very difficult for a lot of fans because that had been a basis for the show for all of this, uh, all this time. Uh, yeah. What was that experience like? 
Well, you know, he, he wanted to leave. And so the question then becomes, how do you make it most dramatic impact and impactful? And I felt that, that the audience, you know, wouldn't necessarily see, see it coming. Right. And, and the, and in drama, you look for those moments, right? You look for moments where you can move an audience or surprise an audience. And I knew when I wrote, uh, when we wrote the, um, the, the episode prior to the season finale uh-huh. that the, I have the Mountie coming in and telling uh, Elizabeth that, you know, Jack mm-hmm. had died. I knew that the audience wouldn't believe it, that many of them would be saying, no, that has to be a mistake. And I wanted to sort of, hold on to the audience until the finale, which, so I, you know, I was hoping that they would just tune in and, and just to be sure. And, and they did. And the last, the, the finale was the highest rated episode they'd ever had the, the, of uh, One Calls the Heart other than uh-huh. the Christmas episode movies. And it was such a powerful uh, story, I felt. I was very proud of that. I, I was on set when we were shooting the, the scenes and, and and the that there's this one there's one episode scene where you know the three women are three women are talking to um, Elizabeth about what it's like to lose uh, their spouse and how powerful and, and emotional yeah, it was. I liked that scene. And and every and they did it like you know when you shoot an episode when you shoot a scene you shoot it like three diff, four different times a close up here and then you do a wide shot and then you turn around and you get the other side and. Every take, the women cried, and every take <laughs> when I was watching it on set, I cried. They were just so good. They, they, you know, the director would yell "cut." The women would come out dabbing their eyes. I'd be dabbing my eyes right next to the director watching the it on the monitor, and then they'd go back in. They'd do it again, same thing. Tears, they, they evoked tears from me. It was just so such a powerful and so. And then, you know, his burial scene, the, the fog rolled in just uh, when uh, to give this really s- dramatic effect. And we could not have afforded to sort of produce that kind of effect. And it was just there. It just came as a result of uh, luck. So it was, no, that's it cool. was really, um, it was in it. Uh, and the bagpipes, it was just so, such a, uh, an emotional scene. I mean, a lot, obviously a lot of fans are angry, mm-hmm. but uh, because they don't want him to go, but, you know, from from our standpoint, he was it was his, you know, he wanted to go. There's nothing you know we could do to keep him there. Mm-hmm. So it, the, you know it was just a matter of making the story as powerful and as dramatic as as we could. And I thought we accomplished that. Mm-hmm. So, Although the many uh, many fans are calling for my head. Eh, yeah. <laughs> well, I I mean, how do you decide in a show like this uh, what kind of what part of history i guess to include and what parts to kind of pretend aren't there <laughs> with uh yeah i mean it's it's the the biggest part obviously that we're pretending is not there is world war one yeah <laughs> we kind of tease about that a little on the podcast <laughs> <laughs> it's you know it's it's um yeah it's just that was sort of a decision that was had been made i think before i got there so i've just uh-huh. been uh going with it and you know, obviously another a big um, sort of, you know, we, we sort of call that area that they live in Can America because they're sort of American and Can- Canadian and it's sort of a mixture of the two. Mm-hmm. But it's, you know, it's, yeah, so it's just, if I feel if we, if, yeah, again, the decision to make it not, not talk about World War One was sort of decided before I got there. But mm-hmm. if it had gone to World War One, we it, it obviously it was a great war, and you cannot not talk about it, and it can't be sort of sort of a, a bigger storyline if you do make if you do go in that area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, do you feel like you brought in a different approach as a new showrunner? I know with I, I've been watching a fan of Doctor Who. And there's always the big talk in Doctor Who of, oh, the new showrunner, <laughs> the, the Chris Chibnall's, you know, he's ruining everything. And, and then there's uh, Stephen Moffat, whoever's the showrunner. Um, and I was just curious, do you feel like you brought something kind of new to the storytelling and what calls the heart? 
you know, I, I it's I don't know if it's for me to say. I mean, if you, yeah. I came in season five, and so if you look at five, six, and seven now, I guess you'd have to just, mm-hmm. you know, make an individual determination. It's it's just it's really hard for me to. Yeah. Um, to I know see. that what I, do, I I know the approach I take to the series, which is mm-hmm. when I when I was uh, when I got to when I was got the job, I I looked at all uh, prior episodes. And they're, what really, I took what I felt uh, worked and I focused on expanding that and, and working on that. And I tell people that the three sort of, you know, was watching it. I, it turns out I'm a little bit of a crybaby because I have a tissue next to me and I dab my <laughs> eyes as I'm watching it. The, but what, what the elements I felt really worked on this show are humor emotion and romance and and Mm -hmm. you know the acronym there is her right so i now every time i you know write a script or i get one of the scripts from the other writers i look at it and ask myself is there enough of her in it if there's you know like each each episode has to have elements of humor emotion romance in it and if there isn't enough then i you know we just have to make some kinds of adjustments so to make sure that it does Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I wish they'd almost have more humor. Uh, I would even up it even more. I, I, cause I, like I, <laughs> I, cause especially for Aaron, because I think that she is at her best when she's a little bit silly. And I feel like the show hardly ever gives her the opportunity to be silly. And so I was really enjoying this last episode where she uh, puts the frosting on, on uh, Nathan's nose and it's just giving yeah. a little bit because I, I just don't feel like we get to see that side of her. And I think Erin is really strong when she's, it doesn't have to be so serious. Yeah, she's a, she's a very strong actress. I mean, what I really, I've told all the actors this and it's true. I mean, I feel on this show, there's a real embarrassment of riches in terms of uh, the acting talent there. I really can, I know I can write, uh, you know, a whole range of emotions from, you know, serious drama to, to humor and, and the actors can just really deliver. And I'm, I'm really big fans of all of them. Yeah, it, 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 for sure. So uh, why, do you, why do you think that the show ha- has gained such a fan base, is so popular? What, what do you think is the, the main appeal of this sort of nostalgic kind of show in a way? Well, I think it's, um, it's unique in the sense that you don't you don't see a lot of shows that deal in this time period that deal that are family friendly um and that have this sort of different the tone that we're we're talking about so I, you know it's always good to be in a field where there's not it's not a crowded field yeah. so that i think that the audience uh knows what they'll get and, and they like sort of tuning in just today i got this little uh email which was great to see that uh, the season seven debut of hallmark of this uh one calls the heart had its highest rating uh season premiere since the program launched in 2014. no way so it's just getting yeah with the live plus three so it's um it gets it it, it continues to grow which is uh, really really uh unique and special at that you know in its seventh season that it's it's bigger than ever which is great yeah. So yeah, I think it was a bit of a risk that you kind of went this sort of love triangle route, and uh, especially with with uh, Nathan's character, him being a Mountie, was that? What, did you think about? Uh, we better not, because people are going to think we're replacing Jack. Were you worried about that? Well, at all? Uh, and that's well, that's why I needed to add another element mm-hmm. and and make them different and what i wanted to do in this with these two characters I, I, that's yeah. all right oftentimes it shows when there are two suitors two potential you know possibilities for a, 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 a lead character one is clearly the right choice yeah and the other isn't right there's like the bad boy or someone who you don't want the audience to start screaming don't go there don't go there but in this what i wanted to do here which I don't think it's been done a lot, which is is create two really good choices for Elizabeth 
and that it not be an easy choice. Yeah. And I think I've accomplished that. And, and, and with two very different characters who offer two very different things mm-hmm. to uh, Elizabeth. So you know, that's sort of been the, and, and because of that, I think that there are strong feelings about who she should end up with. I mean, you have you know, Lucas, who's the guy who's different and who originally, when we introduced him, I wanted to create some mystery around him as to whether he was a good guy or not. Yeah. And then, you know, through the course of time, you find out he is. And he offers something to Elizabeth uh, that that Lucas, uh, that Nathan can't offer him. But, and Nathan is in a, but Nathan is this guy who's a really responsible man who's raising his niece and just, you know, has his, his own strengths. So I felt that, you know, the danger of, of having a mount, another Mountie would be for me to bring a Mountie on the show and, and make that her only option. Mm-hmm. And for people to say, that's, he's not Jack. Right. The, 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 but I, what I opted to do is create two different choices and then make Nathan a strong enough option that people would be saying, take him, go for him, right? I'd rather have the audience say that than me as a writer impose that on an audience. Mm-hmm. We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. They are a new sponsor this week. We're really excited about it. It is the streaming service Sundance Now, and uh, they provide a lot of the kind of interesting content, enlightened content that I just experienced at the Sundance Film Festival here on uh, the streaming service. It's only $4.99 a month. And, you know, we live in a prepackaged world when it comes to TV. We're spoon-fed reality junk, competitive dating shows, and singers behind masks. We need stories with thought behind them sometimes. And, you know, we get that in Hope Valley, but, but sometimes we also need something that's a little bit more, a little bit, a little bit different uh, from different perspectives. It's all, it's good to have both. And, uh, and I think it's something that can be good for your soul, something, some diversity, some, some different topics. And that's what you can get in Sundance now. It's an ad free streaming service created by AMC networks for people who appreciate thought provoking storytelling and fresh perspectives. If meaningful shows are your escape, then Sundance now is the destination. They offer true crime series, dramas, and thrillers from all over the world. Their original series, McMafia, State of the Union, and The Cry have received international praise and awards. One thing that the Hardys might be interested in is they have a very recent version of Wuthering Heights. Uh, If you like costume dramas, which I do, uh, I really enjoyed getting a chance to see that. Uh, And they just have a wide variety of shows plus curated content. So definitely you should check that out Four ninety nine dollars a month. And right now you can try Sundance now free for 30 days by going to sundancenow.com and use code Hallmarkies. That's sundancenow.com. Use code Hallmarkies for 30 days of free streaming. Yeah, I know. I think it's true. I think you've done a good job with that, that uh, I, cause I think side of me wants her to pick Lucas because I think that, it would be more interesting for the character. Uh, but, um, but, you know, Nathan is probably the more sensible choice, especially that, you know, they both be parents. So they'd have more in common. Uh, but, you know, he builds her. Lucas builds her a library. I mean, come on. <laughs> 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 I tell you, even among my, even among my writers last year, it's like, I oh, I'm team Lucas and some of that, you know, same writers are saying, no, I'm team, no, last year was like, I'm team Nathan. Now this year they're saying, no, I'm team Lucas. So there's, yeah. you know, people are, <laughs> even in the writer's room are changing allegiances. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One thing I wondered about, so they have been trying to kind of give this redemption arc to Henry Gowan. And the only mm-hmm. thing that kind of worries me about that is that I feel like the show is going to be kind of left without a proper antagonist. Uh, and I think you need that because you need conflict because that makes the story interesting. And so I'm a little, how do you feel about that, about Henry Gowan? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think well, Martin Cummings is a great actor and I, I really love uh, writing his stuff and he's, he's enjoyed this mm-hmm. journey. The, the, you know, the key to Gowan, Gowan is, is that you not make him a good guy, you make him a complicated guy. And that's what mm-hmm. I'm trying to do this year. I think that, you know, it, it's 
for me, the, the uh, drama is more fun when, when characters are faced with difficult choices and given their sort of personality bent, they opt, maybe opt one way versus the other, as opposed to giving the character who's, who's just like a, arch bad guy like a bad guy i don't want none of these guys i, I want them to be bad and i you know the the advantage for gowan for me was that he was ba- a bad guy initially and i could then now i've made him i believe more complicated and that isn't to say i've made him a good guy and um and and i want to see how i want to put him in position in a position where he has you know difficult choices and where you know, people see him in a certain light because of what he did in the past and, you know, just, uh, you know, and whether, you know, and how he sort of uh, ultimately makes the tough, de- I want to present tough, tough decisions for him and I want to see how he sort of makes whatever decision he's going to make. Because that's so, really the fun. That's the, yeah. that's the fun of writing for something or someone that mm-hmm. is to is to put him in that position. Yeah. So last year, you were put in the position of having to remove Abigail and Cody from the season. And you had about six weeks, maybe something like that. How did you guys pull that off? I mean, that was, I was really impressed. I mean, we were, we were inspecting it with <laughs> with the magnifying glass trying to find the, you know, oh, well, there's Abigail. No, no, no. Uh, yeah. And I, I was really impressed how you guys pulled that off. I mean, what was that like? It was hard. It was, it was, it was difficult. And it was uh, I mean, it, it, just from a, from a writing standpoint, I mean, put aside sort of the emotional component of, you know, knowing Lori and, and having to uh, do that. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the technical component of rewriting the season and re-editing it was, was, it was surgical. I mean, literally in order to do it quickly, we had to find moments where we could like just uh, in an episode, write a few different scenes that would then make the whole episode now cohesive. Mm-hmm. So we would take her, all of her, all of her episodes, all of her scenes out and then say, okay, now where, what's missing from this? How do we bridge this story to this story and just shoot, write specific scenes and then over a course of a week uh just shoot all this all the scenes for the whole season that and then re-edit it uh the hardest uh com- the hardest part was this you know we we ended up we shot in addition to the christmas movie we shot 10 episodes but in order to do what i just described we only shot we only aired nine episodes yeah because of, of how we had to put things together we uh, the hardest the hardest storyline for me was um, where we where, where we mixed two separate sto- two uh, two separate episodes and made them into one. Yeah, that was the like knowing what I know. That's the episode that's sort of like oh, I, there, I wish it was, I wish you you know, I could have you know done more with that. But mm-hmm. that's yeah. Uh, Did you have a stronger <laughs> story for Gowan? Are are you allowed to say? That's what the what we thought. Yeah, oh, yeah. You cut out a lot of Gowan. We did, we did we did cut out Gowan because of his some of Gowan because of his uh, his his uh, connection with to, to the Abigail Car- character. Yeah. And literally, there's one scene that he that was Martin's. He told me it was his favorite scene he's ever done. He never had that. There was on oh, light of day. Man. Yeah. So it's uh, so there was yeah so it was it was a little painful. Well, I mean, and and to cut. To be able to cut Cody out of all the school scenes, that was yeah. also difficult, I'm sure. It was. It was yeah. difficult. It was difficult. We had to, in some cases, it, you know, we had coverage where he would like, you know, in, in a scene, literally, he was like right behind uh, Allie and the other characters, and we could, you know, cut around it so you didn't see that he was behind her. And, and then we had storylines where he was obviously talking, and we had to, you know, take those out. Very impressive. You can tell the whole team that we were we were very <laughs> we did a very good job. Uh, so, uh, so then let's see. Just, where's my next question? Sorry. Um, okay. So then uh, you, we have this new season. We're really excited about it, 
and uh yeah they're uh you know obviously with no spoilers uh can you tell us kind of uh anything sort of what overall to kind of uh anticipate about the new season what you're excited about well there's uh there's some big dramatic turns some life changing moments there's uh and then there's um yeah that involve you know all the characters i think you know some really high stakes come up yeah. are coming up all the way all the way until the the season finale yeah. that you know are just big mm-hmm. um the yeah so just i think it, this year is sort of in some ways bigger i mean other than the fact that well i can't even say it, that there's some really really big moments in this mm-hmm. and really um life-changing and potentially you know uh, I think the I think the fan base at the end of the year is going to be uh, as engaged as they were at mm-hmm. the end of season six. Cool. Yeah, I I think that it's really become more of an ensemble show uh, without uh, Lori and Dan. I don't know. I just I just feel like there's like the whole town. All the characters are sort of needed in a way they might yeah. they weren't quite before which i like to yeah, see yeah it is it is it, 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 it definitely is an ensemble and that's where again yeah. I, I have the strong cast that and i and they've just sort of grown I, the, when i started you know uh, gallon you know i've taken them from jail to uh you know to the you know sweeping out the lumber yard to striking oil <laughs> and uh mm. and i have you know the i have Bill Avery going from a sheriff to a judge and people are just sort of moving and, and growing. Yeah. And so it's, it's fun to write that. Yeah. That was smart with Bill because Bill can be a bit of a <laughs> stick in the mud sometimes. And I think putting him as a judge, cause he's already kind of judgy anyway. Yeah. So just, just make a part of his job. I, mean, I thought it was great. Yeah. It was very smart. Uh, but anyway, so then you have this when hope calls and mm-hmm. i when i first heard about it i was a little bit skeptical because a lot of times these streaming service shows are kind of the second tier like not good enough for prime time kind of uh right. kind of thing and so i i went into it with kind of low expectations uh and i was really pleasantly surprised i mean you could tell that you definitely had spent they definitely spent money for sure on the show and uh, mm-hmm. I really liked the dynamic of having the two sisters as opposed to just being sort of focused on Elizabeth with one close to the heart. And uh, I, I thought that the acting was all pretty strong throughout. And uh, I mean, were you, when you, when you're doing this new show, did you, how are you trying to kind of separate it from uh, when calls the heart, but also bring in that fan base? you don't want to do the same show the, over again right and so what i what i wanted to do with this show is i felt if i would take it up you know geographically north of where hope valley is and that is more remote and a ranching community it would have a different look and uh, that was the, the biggest thing for me is that it one have a different dynamic and a different look and the dynamic of two sisters who don't who don't really know each other, who grew up in different circumstances and who are trying to reconnect. I felt that was a dynamic that had, had a, wasn't, didn't exist in the, that I could tell in the Hallmark world. And, it, you know, Hallmark has shows about relationships and, but this is one relationship I felt they hadn't mined yet. And I felt I could tell a lot of stories with that. So in, you know, in the Christmas movie a couple of years ago, I developed this, spin-off idea and brought these two sisters in with their with their orphans and you know that was sort of the launching the series Mm -hmm. and and you know i could delve delve into both the emotion of the sisters getting to know each other and their own sort of romantic relationships but one thing that hope valley given the where it shoots and you know our budget is i i didn't have a real industry to show there we talk about the mine, you know, the lumber company, and but we never, you know, we see just a, a tiny bit of what the lumber industry would be. So I wanted to be able to 
uh, show whatever the industry was. And cattle is something that we don't see a ranch. So I thought, you know, let's, let's, you know, let's bring that in. And that's, I think, a different look. It looks, the time period's the same, but it looks a little bit more Western because of how, where it is. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, what I, you know, and it, and it really worked. I mean, we, we, we built that town out of, you know, out of nothing. We just started from scratch and, and, uh, and, you know, being on the set of one calls a heart helped me and, and, and coming up with the design of when hope calls, because I, I knew what worked and what didn't and, and what, you know, what kind of sets we'd need. And so it's, it was, it's been, it was, it was a great experience to sort of build it from the ground up. Yeah, I was really impressed. I, I mean, especially they built that whole huge house and and uh yeah. Yeah, it was it was very impressive. So, well, very good. Well, thank you so much for coming and talking uh with us. Well, thank you, Rachel. I, I, the Hardys are going to love this. They're going to be really excited. And <laughs> uh you do you have a social media or anything like that that you want to share or No, I haven't been on partly because yeah. it is sort of uh yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I've, um, I've been <laughs> told okay. I should get on it, but I've been. <laughs> You're smarter. It's hard, or probably saved, it probably saved me a little bit when they were calling for my head. So right. Sort of be, <laughs> be away from it. <laughs> I don't blame you at all. So, well, <laughs> well, thank you again for coming on the show. Uh, we'll have to touch a base with you maybe uh, maybe later in the, se- in the season again or something like that. Sure, anytime. Uh, it's, it's been great. And uh, thank you, so, Rachel. If you all are listening, let us know your, your questions, your thoughts, but all the different things that we've talked about. And, uh, and thanks again. And we'll, yeah, we'll have to switch base again soon. I'd like to thank Alfonso for coming on the podcast. It was a lot of fun. And uh, I hope you all found that really interesting. I know I did. And so let us know your thoughts and make sure you're following the podcast at Hellmarkies Pod and Hellmarkies Podcast, all of our social media and on iTunes and YouTube. And if you're listening on iTunes, please leave us your ratings and reviews. It helps us out so much. And if you're listening on YouTube, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And uh, thanks again to Alfonso. Uh, we have our patron group, so check that out. We also have our merch store, which has some Hardy's inspired uh, merch. So check that out. And uh, thanks again, and we'll talk to you all later. Bye, everyone.